As a teenager, Michael Shermer decided to become a follower of Jesus. But later on in life, when he was in graduate school, he changed his mind and rejected his previous decision. During an interview, he explained how he went from believer to what? To unbeliever. The first thing I want to ask you about is Christianity, because I know I've read a little bit of your biography. I know that you were a Christian at one point. So the first question is, what led you to become a Christian when you decided to become one? Right. Yeah, I've written quite a bit about this in several of my books. Um, it was not a parental influence thing. I wasn't raised religious. My parents were not religious at all. Um, it was more of a peer group uh, influence of my friends in high school. But I took it pretty seriously. And I went to Pepperdine University, which is a Church of Christ school in, in Malibu. And I was a member of the first four-year graduating class from that campus. And it was all in all a good experience. But um, I discovered once I left that um, not being in the Christian bubble where you're surrounded by everybody else who believes the same as you, um, it becomes more difficult to believe in the sense that the beliefs were never founded on good um, evidence in the first place. They, they really are faith-based arguments. You, you just believe or you don't believe. And there may be good arguments you can use for why you believe, but in the end, um, they only work if you already believe and you're looking for justification for your beliefs. Lots of people see religion, including Christianity, as irrational. However, despite what Shermer claims, there are many other people who have studied the evidence, applied their intellect, and then went in the opposite direction. They've gone from unbelief to faith in Jesus. Oh yeah? Prove it! Alright, well, in a moment, we'll talk about one person who did exactly that. But first, let me explain what this series is all about. People often regard faith in Jesus as simply a matter of blind faith. However, there's a whole field of research which seeks to provide rational, credible reasons for believing. This whole discipline is called apologetics. Sorry for what? No, apologetics is not about apologizing, although the words sound similar and are frequently confused with each other. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which refers to giving a defense or providing reasons. So apologetics is about giving reasons or making a defense of the Christian faith. What, now don't get defensive. No, you're still not getting it. It's not about getting emotional, angry, or defensive. It's just about providing logical, rational reasons to believe. Logic. Logic. I'm sick to death of logic. Well, I don't quite know why you don't like logic, but I assure you that when it's done well, apologetics can be really interesting. And it's something that God has used to change people's lives. This whole series is going to help explain what apologetics is all about and why it makes sense to follow after Jesus. The life of Jordan Manji is one example of a life that stands in contrast to Michael Shermer's claims. At the tender age of just four, Jordan was already a skeptic. Her mother actually found her at a party challenging another child about the authority of the Bible. The first kind of story my parents tell me about when I was little is when I was four, my mom was at a party once and she walked into the room to check on me. And all she caught was me telling this other little six-year-old girl but how do you know what the Bible says is true? Later on, when Jordan was in middle school, her atheism was so well known that one of the kids in the school threatened to go to her house and quote, shoot all the atheists. That's not good. In high school, Jordan's Christian friends were scared to talk with her because they knew she could easily tear apart all of their poorly constructed arguments. She even challenged them by bringing a Bible to school with sticky tabs in it, which marked all the apparent contradictions and problems in that book. She's tough and smart. Yeah, Jordan was definitely a tough, smart, young skeptic. So smart, in fact, that after high school, she was accepted into Harvard University. Harvard? Really? Yes, really. The Harvard. And it was while she was at Harvard that she met another student named John Porter. He challenged her on a number of issues pertaining to her atheistic worldview. He was able to address her concerns about contradictions in the Bible and on issues related to the coherence of God. He also challenged her to explain the origin of the universe, 
what caused the universe to come into existence. But where did the universe come from? Where did the universe come from? There was also another issue that had plagued her for some time, and it concerned morality. Where did morality come from, and what was it grounded in? What makes human rights apply to all people in all places and all times? Over time, as she discussed these issues with John and considered the matter in greater depth, she saw that Christianity made a lot more sense than what she had previously thought. And it wasn't until I came to Harvard that I realized there are Christians who do have answers to these questions. Yeah. Uh, I thought that I had thought about it a lot, and really what I had done was just talk to other people who were as dumb and inexperienced as me. Right. And of course, right. they didn't have any better answers than I did. Right. And it wasn't until I really started investigating that I discovered these arguments that I thought were really good against God were actually quite weak, and that people had had <laughs> yeah. rebuttals to them for, for centuries, centuries yeah. if not thousands yeah, of years. Yeah, yeah. So basically I got into a series of arguments with one of my friends who worked for the Harvard ICTHIS. And Probably you want to explain Harvard ICTHIS? Yeah, Sorry. so the ICTHIS is a, a journal of Christian thought and expression at Harvard. One of my friends was writing for it, and he wrote this kind of apologetic in it, and we kept discussing back and forth and, and arguing, basically about, can you be good without God? Yeah. Does, does ethics function if there's no real right. grounding for it? Right. Intellectual grounding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. metaphysical grounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, that was part of the argument, and then we started arguing about, well, what are good arguments for God's existence, and what are good arguments for the Bible being true, or for, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, basically we argued back and forth for about six months, and he just, he kept winning the arguments. Yeah. It was like, <laughs> okay, you know, maybe, maybe you're right. One day, Jordan decided to read the Bible again. But this time, her goal was not to disprove it, but rather to understand it and contemplate it. After reading for a while, she got to the passage that described Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. I had finally made it to the crucifixion scene. And as I was reading it, I had this moment where I just said, no, Aslan, no. As a youngster, Jordan had read the beloved children's book called The Chronicles of Narnia, written by C.S. Lewis. The second book in that series, called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, featured a lion named Aslan who died to rescue the life of a young boy named Edmund. When she read that book, she hadn't realized that the death of Aslan was written as an analogy for what Jesus had done when he died on the cross. When Jordan read the story of Jesus in the Bible, she realized that she was like the young boy in Narnia. She was Edmund, and Jesus had died to rescue her. Immediately clicked, like, I am Edmund, Jesus is Aslan, and he is dying for my sake. Seeing it now with me in the story was just a totally radically new way of looking at it and realizing kind of my own sinfulness in that moment and my own need for healing from that sin made all the difference in how I read it. And so I started just crying, thinking about, really thinking about Aslan, but thinking about Jesus through that process. That moment was a powerful one for Jordan, but at the same time, she wasn't yet convinced that Christianity was actually true. So she plunged into further study, research, and searching. She looked at other religions, at science, and the writings of atheists such as Richard Dawkins. I'm Richard Dawkins. I've been an atheist since I was a child. Along the way, Jordan discovered the rich intellectual tradition that Christianity offered with all the great thinkers through many centuries. Thinkers and scholars such as Augustine, Aquinas, Descartes, Pascal, and Lewis. God was reaching Jordan through her intellect and opening her heart to what really mattered. She realized what love was and what Jesus had done for her. As I thought about what love really was, I could see how Jesus' death on the cross was the perfect embodiment of that. Jordan eventually came to realize that even though her high school friends had not been able to provide a robust case for Christianity, there were certainly others who could provide good answers and who could develop a strong defense. These other people could do it because they had taken the time to study the issues in depth. Jordan realized that Christianity was not simply a matter of blind faith. It actually made sense. 
So Jordan decided to become a follower of Jesus, and on an Easter Sunday morning in 2009, she was baptized. At the beginning of this episode, we heard about Michael Shermer and his rejection of faith in Jesus. In contrast to Shermer is the story of Jordan Manji. She went from unbelief to faith in Jesus while studying at Harvard University. And Jordan Manji is certainly not the only person who's had their life transformed after studying apologetics. In our next episode, we'll learn about someone who spent his life studying philosophy as a committed atheist. Then, towards the end of his life, he changed his mind. You're listening to Lit by Worldview Summit with Peter Kupis.